Good evening and welcome to our second annual TED Ed Evening at Southside High School. My name is Christine Brown. And I'm Nicole Knorr. And we are the advisors of the TED Ed Club. For those who are able, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we begin, we want to thank both our central and high school administration for their support throughout this process. Special thanks to Mark Palmentary, Lauren Reed, Rob Lichter, and the Video Club for their technical support. Many thanks to our TED Ed production crew, Tommy Puccio and Elizabeth Clodfelter. Also, special thanks to Anthony Capuccio for his assistance with the set. Most importantly, though, thank you to the talented students and faculty who are taking part in this special event. Last year, our first TED Ed Night was a wonderful success. It was the beginning of an exciting journey of exploration, rich discussions, self-reflection, research, and collaboration. Our students were filled with curiosity and excitement. This year, that energy continued. Our students developed their talks by identifying ideas and concepts that they truly felt connected to and that they believed were worth sharing. We are grateful to have been on this journey with some amazing students and faculty and are so very proud of their work. We are quite sure that you will be as impressed by our speakers and tonight's presentation. We would now like to welcome to the Red Circle our first presenter, Sadie Sulal, with Being an Outsider. four-year-old girl about to be blown into another town by Hurricane Sandy. A new school with new faces and new things to learn. This is where it begins. On the third day of first grade, other five-year-olds, not knowing what they were about to say, asked me, where are you from? I played soccer and tag during recess while others sat on a bench and silently judged me for not playing house or sitting with them. A couple of spelling tests later, marked all in red, I figured out that my mother was teaching me British English and not American English. I started to learn that I was really good at math and science and not the best at ELA. Middle school is a blur mixed with the occasional terrorist comments, building a mini race car, and COVID-19. If this was a puzzle, I was a piece to a completely different puzzle. Bigger school, bigger problems, better friends. I begin to try new clubs, sports, and community activities where I grow and learn new things. Time passes and so does my grandfather. In school, someone walks up to me and tells me, your grandfather is dead because he flew the plane into the Twin Towers. I now play tennis, which I'm obsessed with, and I meet even more great friends, and now we do everything together. I start to look at college applications and one question sticks to the back of my mind. What is your race? As a proud daughter of two strong, brave immigrants from Trinidad and Tobago, which is in the Caribbean, I'm currently going through an identity crisis where I don't know who exactly I am. People tell me I'm African American, South Asian, and shockingly white. I know that I am me and that's it. I end up in the university of my dreams just like I planned. My identity crisis is over. It has faded into a box called acceptance that can be checked over with confidence. People finally acknowledge and make an effort to pronounce my last name correctly, Sulal. I have a house, 
a family, and my dream job far away from where I grew up. But we still visit for the best slice of pizza and a real bacon, egg, and cheese. Time goes on, and so did I. But I hope you'll learn from my story. Your actions and words will stay with people forever. Thank you. Please welcome to the Red Circle, Mr. Kevin Downey with 50 in 52. It began in this room. It was September 2019, and Mr. Murphy was introducing David Flood, a motivational speaker who was going to be talking to the auditorium full of Southside students. And as part of his introduction, Mr. Murphy said who David Flood was, what he does, and where he came from. But he also mentioned that he had read 52 books in 52 weeks. When I heard it, it seemed like a strange fact to include in somebody's introduction but it stuck with me. I didn't act on it then, but instead let it roll around in my brain for a few weeks. It started with this guy, Bond, James Bond, 007, British secret agent. At first, I thought it would be fun to read each of the James Bond books in order. From 1953 to 1966, Ian Fleming published 14 novels, all written from his estate in Jamaica called Goldeneye, starring a British secret agent often referred to by his code name 007. The James Bond book series is one of the most popular of all time and led to the filming of 27 movies, starting with Dr. No in 1962 and most recently No Time to Die in 2021. I grew up infatuated with James Bond and his gadgets, most notably his Aston Martin sports car. In October of 2019, after uh, about a month after listening to David Flood's introduction, I walked into my local library and picked up a copy of Casino Royale, Fleming's first book published in 1952. I read it in a few days and was eager to pick up the next, Fleming's 1953 novel, Live and Let Die. At this time, I was simply looking to enjoy reading the series, but soon it shifted to a clearly defined goal. Starting in October 2019 and ending in October 2020, I read one book a week. In addition to all of the James Bond books, I read every type of literature available, fiction, nonfiction, biography, and autobiography. I read books I had already read before and books I had never heard of. I read books cover to cover in one sitting. I read books recommended by friends and books I saw strangers reading in public. I read books I heard about on podcasts, TV shows, movies, YouTube videos, and interviews. I read books I heard about from reading other books. I read books on planes, trains, and beaches. I read long books and short books, and in total, over the course of the year, I read just over 18,000 pages. For this year, I always had a companion, something to always look forward to, something to talk about, and something to think about. As much as I enjoyed the reading itself, the search for the next book was just as fun. It was a conversation piece and an icebreaker with students and even strangers. I would ask, what have you read recently? Or, what is your favorite book? I would add the recommendation to a note in my phone and later research it religiously. Who wrote it? What was it about? How long is it? Would this be something I would enjoy? Over the course of the year, I found myself being more observant, more curious, and a better listener. Finding the books themselves was also a quest. In March of 2020, just a few months into my reading goal, the world shut down due to COVID-19. Libraries closed and my attention shifted to my safety, the safety of my family, and the overwhelming information overload that was happening on a day-to-day -day basis. It was hard to keep up with how everyone was doing, how everyone was managing the confusion, and how people were even ordering their groceries. We can all remember the stress and confusion of that time. At night, I would lay in bed and be able to escape the turmoil of the pages, uh, the turmoil of the world, in the pages of a book. I kept notes and completion dates on each book that I finished. In preparing to give this talk, I looked back on the books I read during that time and noticed a strange and striking trend. I finished The Revenant by Michael Punk on March 21st, a book that was later turned into a movie starring Leonardo DiCaprio about a frontiersman being mauled by a bear and left for dead. 
I finished Frankenstein by Mary Shelley on March 28th, a book written in 1816 when Shelley was just 19 years old about a terrible monster that escaped from a lab. I finished The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test by Tom Wolfe on April 4th, a book about counterculture and a shift in creative thinking. I finished A Walk in the Woods by Bill Bryson on April 11th, a book about getting outside and walking the Appalachian Trail. All of these books represented a state of mind and a moment in time that we can all remember from the spring of 2020. One of loneliness, fear, a shift in thinking, and a great desire to get outside. As I mentioned, finding these books during the world shutdown was not easy. I turned to friends and family members who would send a photo of their bookshelf and offer a few suggestions for me to browse. They would then sanitize a book and leave it on their front stoop so that I can stop by and pick it up without any human contact. As the borrower of the book, I enjoyed the brief human connection, and I know that each of the people I borrowed the books from enjoyed it as well. It brought us together and allowed us to talk about something other than what was happening in the news. Eventually, a library reopened a few towns over, and throughout the late spring and summer, I was able to request books online and pick them up in person. The library had been set up outside where books were quarantined for three days before being brought into the library, and then again for three days before they were turned over to the reader. I was so thankful to be able to research new books and continue to take my mind off of everything. The books that I read during this time were also indicative of my state of mind as the world eased into COVID-19. I read 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne in one sitting on May 24th, a story about discovering an unexplored area. I read Jaws by Peter Benchley on June 7th, a book about finding and killing a tremendous beast of a shark. I finished Tribe by Sebastian Younger on July 30th, a book recommended to me by a friend all about belonging and how traumatic events bring people together. Looking back on this list of books make, re, makes me remember the thoughts and emotions of the world at this time. Exploring a new world, finding and harnessing a beast, and sharing experiences. On October 7th, 2020, I finished The Living Daylights, the 57th, 52nd book of the year and the last Ian Fleming novel published in 1966. Ironically, the book is a collection of short stories all involving the hero, James Bond, who despite all odds, saves the world from evil. The collection of stories is a metaphor for my goal. Each book was read during a very specific time in my life. Upon completion of the goal, I felt accomplished and satisfied. Completing my goal also left me with a greater appreciation for books in general and a greater appreciation for the process of writing a book. When I walk through a bookstore, I feel humbled by the books around me. As I wander through a library, I get tremendous comfort from the large stacks of books. Within each of them lies a story that took time to create and craft. Each word in each sentence was likely thought about, written deliberately, edited, and agonized over. I reflect on how long it has taken me to write this TED Talk, and I have a huge appreciation for authors and writers all over the world. To end, a confession, a warning, and some advice. I confess that I have slowed down on my reading, and I have gone from fiction and nonfiction to Dr. Seuss and picture books. I have been spending as much time as possible with my wife and young daughter, but I know that my love of reading has rubbed off on her. My warning is to never let a goal slow you down. Reading 52 books in 52 weeks is attainable for everyone. I did not have to change my lifestyle to complete the goal, and at no point did I ever feel like I had to stop what I was doing and read. Instead of watching TV at night or staring at my phone, I would pick up a book and read anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes. On the weekends, I would spend around 90 minutes reading, and whenever I had some downtime or traveled, I would read. At no point did I feel like the goal was bringing me down or taking me away from the other things that I enjoy. I was able to incorporate it into my routine and found that it enhanced my experience and enriched my life. I always had something to talk about, and I was able to make connections with anyone I encountered. My advice is to find something that motivates you and allow it to help you create a goal. Goals can center us and keep us present while still looking forward. They help us reassess ourselves and can help build self-awareness. Periodically, sit down and reflect on where you are at and how you could better yourself. It can be an incredibly rewarding process. 
Many themes stood out throughout my reading of the books, but especially the 14 Bond novels. In addition to entertaining the reader with exciting action, iconic villains, and cool gadgets, Fleming focused on the effects of World War II, themes of good versus evil, and camaraderie. Throughout the series, Bond stays connected with other agents who step in to save his life on more than one occasion. Although reading is generally, done something, is generally something done alone, I found that this goal helped build my camaraderie with other people, even during a time when we were conscious about staying apart. You can always connect with someone about something, no matter who they are or where they came from. All you have to say is, what are you reading? Thank you and good night. Mr. Downey. We would now like to welcome to the Red Circle our next presenter, Cooper Gottsint, with Music and Identity. To play a wrong note is insignificant. To play without passion is inexcusable. Ludwig von, von Beethoven said this. Now you may be questioning to yourself, why would such a renowned composer with so many notated works in the modern orchestral world, why would he talk about not playing the right notes? Well, the purpose of the quote is not actually to downplay the importance of right notes, but more about to highlight the importance of the lesser known factor of music, the vulnerability and expression it takes to play it. Now, everyone is vulnerable in their everyday lives. I know I am, even if we don't realize it. One example, raising your hand in class. You raise it every day, but you never have the 100% certainty that you're gonna have the correct answer. That actually very easily translates into music. You go out on a stage to perform, but you never have that 100% certainty that you're gonna play every note correctly. My first introduction to the the world of expression and music was my introduction to jazz. This is a lead sheet. One, it's a very popular jazz tune, but there's minimal information on it. Now, this tune is normally played around a variety of lengths, like five to 10 minutes. Now, you may be asking yourself, how is this turn into a five to 10 minute song when there's just a melody line and some chords? That's where the creativity comes in because there's so many solos of so many choruses that professional musicians take to express their creativity. As a drummer, the first time I saw this, I was terrified. There's no written drum part. There's nothing telling me what to do. Playing orchestral music, you have a very easily mapped out way. But this was a whole new world for me. Now, no, knowing the nature of jazz, there is a time and a place to go off the script. But that made me think, in what other ways can I be expressive like I am in jazz in my other ensembles? Which brought me back to this idea. It's not just about the notes that are written on the page. It's about how you play them or how you phrase them. But it's not always an individual decision that each individual makes in an ensemble. Typically, in a larger ensemble, it is the job of the conductor. The conductor, whether we know it or not, is telling the group how to phrase something, to express it in the way that they think it should be played, in either to invoke an emotion or just what sounds good to an audience. I started noticing this in my ensembles that I take here at the school and in extracurricular ensembles, that conductors were telling the, the sections to play it a certain way. Now, when I started to notice this, I also started beginning to study solo music, which is the total opposite of what an ensemble is. And solo music, you're completely alone. No one to follow but yourself, and you can express it however you would like. You're able to cre take the creative liberty normally given to a conductor and play it in a way that expresses you. But actually, although we might not realize it, or it might be kind of not so known, 
the ensembles and solo music kind of have a symbiotic relationship where I found practicing my solo music and being able to phrase it in the way that expresses me the most was able to give me more skills to take criticism from my directors and turn it into something that they would like. And learning to play expressively in both of those facets have made me a better musician and a better person to work with in an ensemble. And I've also seen the be benefits of playing expressively firsthand. As I was in a college audition just a month ago, I have messed up a whole bunch. But the first thing the professor said to me after I was done playing was I really appreciate your musicianship and the way that you express the music and not just listen to the notes on the page. Now, a lot, he also mentioned to me that a lot of young players don't really do that. So my advice would be to any young players trying to become better musicians is to be not only to look at the notes on the page, but to find ways to make the notes come to life. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce Ms. Christine Brown with I Am A Pencil. Okay, so we begin with a little bit of audience participation. Um, please take a moment just to speak with someone to the left or the right of you. What's your go-to? It seems like conversation was easy because if you could choose your go-to, you know exactly what you'd lean toward. But have you ever thought about what that says about you? Have you ever thought that your writing implement of choice is a reflection of your personality? Well, for me, pencil to pen was a rite of passage, something that I had not thought about. I think it was in the fifth grade, exactly, when they told me I was allowed to use pen. And since that day, I really had never turned back. I used pencil all throughout middle school, high school, even in college. Maybe in college, I did use a little too much highlighter in the very expensive and used textbooks that uh, my parents paid for, but still, I kept to the pen. And then when I graduated college, people bought me a lot of pens, fancy pens, as graduation pe presents. Some of you in the audience, uh, you might remember the store in the mall, Things Remembered. I felt like that was a very common graduation gift, a pen from Things Remembered. Maybe it was monogrammed or engraved, cherry wood, shiny sterling silver, as if that would actually get you the job. Now, fast forward to my teaching life. When I was a little kid, my teachers would use this silver double-sided pen. It wrote in red on one side and blue on the other. And to me, it was like the teacher's magic wand. I could not believe that I was finally writing with this double-sided pen. So as a teacher, you add red ink to your life, except that right around the time I became a teacher, I was told not to write in red ink because when you write in red ink all over your students' work, it looks like you're bleeding all over the page. So write in anything but red ink. Choose a color other than red. It was not really until the worldwide pandemic that I found an appreciation for the pencil all over again. I can't believe that we're coming on just four years ago. Schools were shutting down. I remember standing in the main office at the high school, not knowing when I would see my colleagues again, um, offering hugs. Some people accepted the hugs. Some people said the last thing they wanted to do was hug a person at a time like this. But I just didn't know, would this last a day? 
a few days, would we be back to work, back to school in a week? Certainly no longer than that. Well, responsibilities were changing, and they were changing as fast as the virus count and the death toll were rising. At first, my job was to post work for the week, asynchronous assignments for my students. Then the job changed, hold office hours and extra help for students. Then we moved into synchronous teaching. I would hold Google Meet lessons during the actual class periods when we would normally meet if we were in school. All I know was there was too much change and it was time for me to return to pencil. Every day, I started my day in the dining room, which was now my new classroom, with a legal pad and a pencil. Why? Because I was fearful. I felt like I couldn't commit to anything. I needed the ability to change. How I felt was like that dull pencil that you're looking at on the screen. So really what I needed was the sharpest pencil I could find all the time. I went out and bought several different pencil sharpeners to have in every room of the house. Pencils always had to be sharper than how I was feeling. Over the pandemic, there were chapters. First, quarantine. Then finally, I could come back to school and be with some of my students again in a hybrid model. Then we put all of you with the plastic dividers around you. I used to call you my little goldfish. You look like goldfish in a little fish bowl. Finally, we were back together again, but masked. To me, I felt like a sharpened pencil that kept breaking. You know when you go to sharpen a pencil and you don't understand why that particular pencil is jinxed? You keep sharpening it and it breaks. And you keep sharpening it until it's down to a little nub and it's just done you wrong the whole time. That's kind of what I felt like. So now, pandemic over. And yet, I haven't given up on the pencil and I put myself through it. I would ask myself the question, like, why not? Am I suffering from a post-traumatic stress? Um, am I forever changed? Is this a flaw in my personality that I'm sticking with the pencil? And upon thinking about it, I realized pencil is not for the fearful or for those who cannot commit. Pencil is for those who embrace change, who are open to revising, and who are committed to their growth. So now I'd like more so to think of myself as pencil sharp and eraser ready for whatever lies ahead. Thank you. I'd now like to replace myself on the red circle with another speaker. Um, <laughs> we now introduce William Claude Felter to the red circle with Be True to You. Has anyone here ever watched the movie Happy Feet? Turn and talk to a partner. So for those of you who don't know, Happy Feet is a 2006 animated movie by Warner Brothers about a penguin named Mumble who has a really good ability to dance while other penguins have a really great ability to sing. And ultimately, the movie Happy Feet is about how that changes his life. Now, when you're a kid and you watch Happy Feet, you think, oh, this, is, this movie is trying to convey a message about how being different is a really great thing and how it can change your life in a good way. But when you grow up, you realize, oh, this is a cash grab with a ton of pop songs in it. But I kind of want to focus on that younger understanding today. Now, when I started TED-Ed, 
I had no idea what I was going to talk about. And around, I think, three weeks into TED Ed, the teachers went around and they asked, so what do you want to talk, do for your TED Talk? And I said, oh, I want to make a talk about how people are like penguins. And they said, well, why do you want to do that? And I said, I don't really know. <laughs> but as the year went on, I slowly started to understand why I ended up picking that. So I did morning news, the elective this year, and I did that for the first semester. And for the first couple of weeks, I didn't really talk much. I basically did the bare minimum. I did the job that I had to do, and that was basically it. But around the third week, I started to talk with some of the other members. And once I started to talk to some of the other members, my experience really changed. I really started to enjoy it a lot more. Like, and you really start to get this feeling of like everybody working together. And it's a feeling that you really can't get in a lot of places. And I think in that moment, I felt like a penguin because of how different it was and this like huge feeling of working together to put on this show, which goes on every day. And I still do it every other day. Every weekend, I used to go to the library. And I used to go with my friends. And we used to we'd just do homework, usually. We usually we wouldn't be there for more than like two and a half hours at the most. And this weekend, it turned out that I did not have any homework. So my friends, they were like, oh, do you guys want to go to the library? And I said, well, I don't really have any work. And they said, well, that doesn't matter. And then I got a little bit confused. So I started asking, but like, I don't have any work. And they're like, so you can just come and help us anyway. And I'm like, it's not my job. And they're like, oh, we don't really care. <laughs> I felt like a penguin in that moment because it kind of felt like I was singled out there. And it felt like it was not my job. And they were trying to push something on me that I didn't have to do. That was in late September. And maybe flash forward a week. And now we were at the pep rally shoot. And I was in the video club. And I'm, I'm still in the video club. And we were doing the pep rally shoot. And that happened. So I got out of, I got out of eighth period. I went to the room where we would record it. And it ended up being a camera. And the, the bleachers kind of like to the left, if you're sitting on the bleachers. That's where I was. So I ended up recording the whole thing. And I remember as I was recording with that camera, I remember I looked around at all the other people. And I just thought, like, man, I am one of the only like 10 people in the school right now who is not just sitting there and watching the show, but basically participating in it, because I'm helping immortalize it basically for ages to come. I felt like a penguin in that moment because I felt special. This was something that only I was, or at least only me and a like few other people were experiencing and would ever get to experience. Eventually, a month passes and Halloween comes around. And we're all at my friend's house just hanging out because we're already done trick-or-treating. And one of my friends literally jumps on top of me for a solid minute. It was the longest minute of my life. And everybody was laughing. So I ended up so then he ended up getting off me after a minute. And after that, I left. And then everyone decided to act confused, like I was the one who did something wrong. They were like, what are you doing? Why are you leaving? It was just a joke. And I said, that's not fair to me. I felt like a penguin in that moment because, again, I felt like I was being singled out. And like it was basically me against the world. Eventually, the drama production, Peter and the Starcatcher comes up. And we needed someone for, I think, one of the spotlights because the person who was going to do it originally ended up having a swim tryout that day, the day that the show was going on, so we couldn't do it anymore. So I was going to do the spotlight to the, in the right of the pit. Unfortunately, the, that spotlight was broken, apparently, before the show like even started production. So I ended up just helping out in the back, and I moved one single ladder in the back. And I had to be in costume for that and everything. So what I would do was I would wait in the back, and then I would put the ladder in position. And then after that, I'd go around, change my costume, and then I'd go up and help the video club. That was, I think, one of the most fun experiences of my life. One, because it was a little bit stressful, because you got to run 
all the way around, go change out, and then I got to run all the way up to the video club. I still was able to help the entirety of Act 2, and I was able to get a lot of the angles beforehand, and that was pretty good. I felt like a penguin in that moment because I was kind of like two-timing, basically the drama club and the video club, and I was actually the only person in the school who was getting to do, like within the span of an hour, being within, basically being within two different clubs. That was probably one of my favorite experiences this whole year. Eventually, late November rolls around, and I'm eating lunch with a, with a good friend of mine, and he tells me, you know you're gonna regret doing all those clubs, right? And this was so out of nowhere, I had no idea what he was talking about. And then he's like, well, you know, you're doing too much, the workload is gonna be too big, and you're just gonna end up crushing to all the, from all the pressure. And I tried to sit there and explain to him why he couldn't say that to me. And then I think as I was leaving lunch that day, I finally realized why I came up with that topic. How are people like penguins? People are penguins through their actions. People are penguins if they dive in head first to activities or if they take risks and they don't know what's gonna happen. People are penguins through their actions. I was a penguin this year because this year I swam to catch fish. I jumped in head first. I didn't know how it was gonna end up. And ultimately, I think I had one of the greatest years of my life. Despite all those bad moments I brought up, there were so many of those good moments. And ultimately, I just had one of the best, I think this was one of the best years of my life. So how can people be penguins? By going out and trying something new. And that's what I want all of you in the audience to do. And it doesn't have to be something big, like you don't have to join a club or like pay for a yoga class, but it could be something as small as like going to the movies and seeing a movie that you're not sure, that you're not sure you're gonna like. And I think ultimately it's not about the scale of that action, but it's just about going ahead and taking that first step. You don't know if you're gonna like that movie or you're not sure if you're gonna like yoga, but it's about taking that first step. Because ultimately, there's no harm in waiting for a fish to pop out of the sea. But ultimately, wouldn't it be more fun to chase after it? Thank you. Next, I would like to welcome Mr. Herb Weiss with The Price of Aging. Uh, good evening. I'm going to give my uh, talk on the price of aging. And I want to start the story with life expectancy, our environment, and the unintended consequences that it all has. You know, we're born, we go off to school, we graduate high school, go to college, have a family. Maybe some of us don't have a family, we buy a house, go career, second career, retire, hate to say it, but we're all going to die. But let's talk about what happens during that whole process. And let's, back, let's go backward in time. Let's go back to 1950. In 1950, you can all see the blue shaded area. That blue shaded area showed the countries where we had a life expectancy of 70 plus. Sounds relatively normal. Now we'll go to the red shaded areas. Red shaded areas are the areas where life expectancy was only going to be 45 years and the gray was, you know, somewhere in the middle. Now we're going to fast forward that. Fast forward that to 2005. Take a look at the blue areas. In the blue areas you have life expectancy of 70 plus. It's a problem. In fact, right now, there are over 8 billion people in the world. And what happened is, just the population just keeps growing. We have generations stacking one on top of the other on top of the other. In fact, one in five Virginians, in fact, one in five Americans 
in the next seven or eight years are going to be 65 years or older. With that, there comes a problem. It's an unattended problem. Now, the reason this all happened was because in the mid-century, we discovered things like capturing nitrogen. Franz Haber discovered the Haber process in the 1930s, and we were able now to take the nitrogen from the air, put it into the soil, feed the masses. He had discovery of penicillin by saw. And with that, we eradicated such diseases, such as measles, mumps, rubella, smallpox. Oh my God, people are living. Which leads us to this unintended consequence. And that is, with so many people living, and so many people on the earth. Okay, what about our environment? In fact, what you can see here is as the population grows exponentially, so too does the concentration of carbon dioxide that is being released into the atmosphere. Well, at this rate, I'm gonna tell you, civilization, that's gonna go kaput. And now we have to say, what is it that we can do? What is it to do? Well, I'm going to tell you a story now. I'm going to tell you a story about an individual named Craig Venter. Actually, before I tell you about Craig Venter, I'm going to bring you to a, your high school days. In high school, you guys have all learned about cells, and how cells actually come from pre-existing cells. Well, guess what? That's not always true. Which brings me to the person called Craig Venter. Craig Venter was a man who said, wait a minute. I know what we learned. I know what was always out there. But I don't believe it. As a matter of fact, what you see up here are Southside students. We saw Craig Venter talk about eight years ago. And what he talked about was this. He was the first person and the only person so far that has developed a life that did not come from pre-existing life. Oh my God, modern day Frankenstein. What he did, he took chemicals from a lab, he took a dead cell, sometimes bacteria, sometimes algae, he sequenced the DNA, put the DNA the way he wanted to put in, where no other life has ever existed in that form before. And he brought it to life. And that cell reproduced other cells. Yeah, he's a modern day Frankenstein. Tell you what, scared the crap out of the extreme right, who said life has got to come from pre-existing life. But guess what? He proved them wrong. If you look at the Irish Times, 2017, they even talk about Craig Venter in there. And they said, you know, perhaps he is a modern day Frankenstein, bringing things to life that never existed. In fact, if you were to Google Craig Venter, and I ask them to be to Google him at the end of the show, you will get hits that say Craig Venter, Dr. Frankenstein. But who is Craig Venter? Craig Venter is a man with an imagination, a person with imagination. And he didn't invent this just to invent it, because on the surface, that mold, that cell, that algae, is no more valuable than maybe the mold that grows in a bachelor's refrigerator. But you know what? In fact, it is. He knew what he was doing. And he knew there was a problem out there. And the problem that he saw out there was this increased greenhouse gas called carbon dioxide. Now, what he ended up doing with his bio, with his cells, particularly with algae, is he created algae that would absorb the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and decrease the concentration of the greenhouse gas. Now, if you look at the vats, those are all the algae that you see that he's collecting. 
Well, what do you do with this algae now that it has a full of carbon-rich element? Craig Venter didn't stop there. He said, I'm not only going to decrease the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, what I'm going to do is we're going to use this for fuels. Matter of fact, we're going to take that algae, rich in carbon, and we're going to put it into your gas tanks. We're going to put it into your homes to cook. We're going to put it into your homes to heat them. Oh my God, think about that. Net carbon zero. You're going to take out the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and you're going to put it into cars, and you're not going to pollute the atmosphere. Oh my God, that's amazing. Now I bring this all up because my students, my students are the imagination of the future. Not only my students here, every one of you sitting in, my, in the seats right here, but students around the world. You guys are going to be the future to basically save the earth with your imagination. And that's where I'll leave it with you. Thank you. We'd now like to welcome to the Red Circle our next presenter, Eniola Bangbose. Is it better to give in or give up? Better yet, is it better to surrender or die? That's a question that a lot of people have definitely thought about. But before I proceed, I want you to think about this hypothetical question. Imagine you're a soldier in hiding, surrounded by troops of the opposing country. The, con the opposing country harbors a lot of hatred for your home country, so there's no way of sweet them sweet talking to accept you. You are severely low on food supplies, and you have no water left for you. The animals are getting more and more aggressive each day and you have grown weaker and weaker each day. So you can't really fend them off the way you used to. Would you wave the white flag or would you accept your fate? One of my favorite movies to watch is historical K-dramas, historical K Korean dramas. There's often a scene about the court and the king, and in those court scenes, there are ministers and court officials who serve the king. Their main purpose is to advise the king on the best course of action to take when trouble arises in the country. In one of the historical Korean dramas I watched, there was an invasion. The ministers did their job and advised the king to keep fighting, never give up. They studied the pattern and methods that the, of invasion that the intruders used in order to find a way to defeat the intruders. The problem, however, was that the Joseon people, Korean people, were getting demolished. Their land was getting ransacked, and the people were suffering. The king was stuck, because you see, although the solution seems easy, keep fighting, the people keep fighting. The people were suffering. What decision should the king choose? Should he keep fighting a battle that might, they might never win, or should they wave the flag and put a stop to the suffering of his people? Well, the king chose the latter. To him, you see, the disgrace him and his country would have faced was worth the life of his people. The funny thing, though, was that the people resented the king because he surrendered. To them, the king was nothing but a coward who made a mockery of his land and the people. The meaning of the word surrender is to cease resistant to an enemy or opponent and to submit to their authority. As a young girl, I grew up with two cultures. And there's a fight within me to represent my native culture wherever I go. But there, but I, and I have been to a lot of places. I struggle to assimilate because to, to me, assimilation is an assassination of a part of me. I didn't want to be considered a sellout. I didn't like to be called Americana. And I let what people thought of me, what they said, how they viewed my culture, how they viewed American culture, control me. For a long time, I refused to change my accent. I refused to change my mindset, the way I dressed, the way I talked, who I hung out with, the friends I made, the food I ate, 
and the music I listened to. My culture was a vessel, and I did not want to drop it because I was reaching for a plastic cup. I didn't see American culture as culture for a long time. And the fact that my culture was looked down on by a lot of Americans that I had come in contact with strengthened my guard. And apart, of the, and apart from the overwhelming urge to not surrender my culture, I felt, all, I felt most of all the urge to not surrender my friends. Even though I was getting dragged like a rag tied to a car that's moving on a rough and dirty terrain, I hung on. I clung on like it was the last thing I could ever do. One thing, however, that's common in both American and Nigerian culture, my culture, is the saying, do not give up. I, and a lot of people, tend to mix the meaning of surrender with not give up and not giving in. The phrases, not giving up and not giving in, have the same relationship with the word surrender as the way rectangles and squares do to, sorry, a square is a rectangle, but a square is not, but a rectangle is not a square. Likewise, not giving up and not giving in is a type of surrendering. However, these are not the limits to the word surrender. And they should not be considered the limits to the act of surrendering. Never give up is oftentimes referring to ambitions and desires. And ambition and desires can be affected by one's root. Never give in, however, has to do with an identity, which is why we as people need to have roots. Not being swayed is key. A difference between a leaf and a tree is that the root stabilizes the tree. I wanted to be a tree. The only way I thought that I could be a tree is to be only be rooted in a singular type of sand, of sand. It took me my middle school and high school years to realize that surrendering takes on different forms and surrendering does not equate defeat. To surrender, depending on the context, because well, What's life without context? Takes bravery, humi bravery, humility, and intelligence. It takes bravery to step in the territory of the unknown. It takes humility to try to mix in with people who are different from you and take time to understand the culture. And it takes intelligence to be able to merge two cultures that you are a part of and make it one, you. A great way of, to look at this is through the game of chess. Sometimes, you need to surrender a piece to protect your king. And in my situation, I had to surrender myself in exchange for my piece. With that realization, I was able to let go of certain things and accept in a couple of things as well. For one, I was able to let go of the mindset that held me back. Sure, if you're someone as stubborn as I am, it was not easy. But when I did, I was able to exhale. I was able to broaden my horizon I didn't get mad when someone called me Americana. I was settled in myself. In fact, I was so settled in that my roots grew deeper because adult trees are planted in one soil, the grains of the soil are different types. Yet, that does not affect the growth of the tree. In fact, manure is key in a strong tree. And if you have to shed some leaves to become stronger, I should. I realized that I wasn't wrong before, and I did. I knew that I was Nigerian, but what I did not realize was that I was also an ambassador. But back to my question, what did you choose? If you chose to stay and accept your faith, raise your hand up. <laughs> if you chose to leave, raise your hand up. Okay, okay. I find that a lot of people chose to stay because they don't want to surrender. But you see, the crux of the matter is, either way, you're surrendering whether you like it or not. If you chose to go out, you are choosing to surrender your feelings and your situation. If you chose to stay, you're surrendering to the will of your country. But the thing is, what if your country had changed their views while you were in hiding? What if your country want, wanted you to surrender because they valued your life more than what they could lose? What if your country had made peace with the other country, but you couldn't realize it because you were stuck where you were? The situation of the king I mentioned earlier is rather interesting because although he thought that he was, when he surrendered, who, who was surrendering to the intruders, and that was the only type of surrendering he thought about. But honestly, he was, about to, he was bound to surrender to something anyway. According to my Apple iPhone, surrendering means to cease resistance to an enemy or opponent and submit to their authority. But people often forget, you can be your worst enemy. 
The reason that I'm up here is because I realize that the opinions of other people has held me, held me hostage, even though they didn't know exactly what I was going through. I realized that not all advices I got were wrong, per se, but not all were applicable to me. It would be stupid of me to not realize the necessity of other people's advice, but it would be self-destructive to not realize that not all advice would work in my favor. The people that called me Americana weren't there when my reading level was bumped down because of my accent. They weren't there when my name was switched to, from Eniola to Enibola because of Ebola. They weren't there when I refused to eat my homemade lunch because I was scared people were going to t act like my food was disgusting because it was foreign and smelt a little off to them. They weren't there when I got bad grades because the accent of the, my teacher was too complicated for me to understand, so I got lost in classes a lot. They weren't there when I stopped being the loudest person in the room to the quietest. But to an extent, they were right. I had to represent my culture. I had to carve a path. I was an ambassador after all. However, I knew I had to know my limits. I had to find a perfect equilibrium because I was but a child after all. Thank you. And now for our final presentation of the evening, I would like you to please welcome Elena Mingorance with appearance and performance. Good evening, my name is Elena Mingorance and I'll be discussing the impact of appearance on work-based performance. Did you know that if a female student wore a bikini to an exam, she might perform worse? Did you know that if a male student wore a bathing suit to an exam, he would perform the same? A few years ago, I came across an article labeled, The Swimsuit Becomes Us All. The study examined the cognitive abilities of groups of males and females through math exams. Both groups dressed in either revealing swimsuits or comfortable sweaters. The study concluded that those dressed in provocative swimsuits became hyper aware of their bodies, drawing their attention to themselves and receiving worse math results. Those in sweaters performed better. In sixth grade, I did not dress to test. Feeling unimpressive in my clothing made me self-conscious, distracted, unfocused. It's been shown that females most often exhibit these feelings of self-consciousness, described with the term self-objectification, which often increases feelings of shame and distraction as they are preoccupied with their own appearance. However, some ideas of the impact of professionalism in clothing are not always limited to women. Additional studies have extended certain forms of dress and its impact to both males and females. And so in middle school, I decided to put this into practice. I dressed to test. I dressed very intentionally to feel comfortable and presentable for school exams. It felt as if I were dressing the part, allowing myself to feel that I would do well, projecting higher standards to feel prepared. I followed this regime religiously, continuing from middle school and even through the pandemic, where I felt the need to ready myself with hair, makeup, collared shirt, and even real pants, and to turn my camera on, as looking school appropriate served as a form of motivation. While I not only achieved higher scores, I felt that I acted better, even communicated better, demonstrating such an experiment's effect on performance in addition to character. With high school came an influx of testing, making it increasingly difficult to maintain my wardrobe in order to dress to test. In an attempt to reflect my readiness for a given day, I resorted to smaller things. Jewelry, for example. Earrings, more specifically. I received such positive commentary on my earrings that encouraged my optimism and was mirrored not only on my exams, with my interactions between teachers and peers. I began to seek wildly unique earrings, and when I felt that it ceased to suffice, I began to make my own. My academics began to reflect in my outward appearance through jewelry. 
I created symbolic earrings for The Handmaid's Tale. I currently wear neuron earrings for science labs, rulers for math, and other statements that aim to convey my interest in school subjects. And as my earrings evolved and became more elaborate, my passions for subject matter deepened, positively influencing performance. From a broader perspective, things have changed. I feel a pandemic has encouraged athletic and loungewear to have become the preferred fashion. Pajama pants have become a staple in high school aesthetics. What I'm proposing is a reevaluation. Might our current fashion be affecting our performance as a society? Consider, our sweatpants might be affecting our grades. A revolutionary transformation could be as small as earrings. So perhaps we should all dress for success. Thank you. That concludes our TED Ed evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. We hope that you enjoyed both our student and faculty talks, and we hope that you will leave feeling inspired to identify your passions and your ideas worth sharing. Thank you very much. <laughs>